This is the audio-described version of the 1922 silent film Monsters of the Past. If you would like to recreate the original silent film experience, please mute the volume now. A text card depicts the film's name in fancy writing. Monsters of the Past, the story of the great dinosaurs by Arthur Sterry Coggeshall. Over a painting of an ocean sunset, it says, The Forenoon of Time. Ages before the Rocky Mountains reared their snow-capped peaks into the clouds, much of that vast country west of the Mississippi River was covered by great inland seas, tropical lakes, and swamps. Here lived the dominant animals of the time, reptiles both great and small, for this was the age of reptiles. The largest were slow-moving vegetable feeders, 75 to 100 feet long and weighing 30 to 40 tons. A painting of two brontosauruses feeding in a swamp by the famous paleoartist Charles R. Knight appears on screen. A text card reads, Though colossal, they had many enemies. Flesh-eating reptiles, much smaller and very agile, preyed upon them. Another painting shows a meat-eating dinosaur holding itself up with one small arm. It swipes at a stegosaurus with huge claws. Another text card states, the long tail of the great vegetable feeders was a weapon of defense upon land, but when attacked in the water, was useless. In a water battle, the smaller antagonist had no trouble in killing his prey. A painting shows a meat-eating and plant-eating dinosaur thrashing in water. The meat-eater holds onto the plant-eater's back with sharp claws, biting into its neck. Quote, Most animals leave no trace after death. Some, dying in the water, have been covered by sand and their skeletons turned to stone. These petrified skeletons are preserved in a rocky tomb, built as are the great mountains, one grain of sand upon another. A photograph appears on screen. These are the rocky hills of what is now Dinosaur National Monument, where dinosaur bones are found. Quote, Untold ages have passed, and now, through great earth movements and erosion, nature's sculptor, these tombs have again been opened. A photograph depicts the rocky canyon at Gates of Lador, where the Green River flows through. Quote, For many years, fossil bones of these great reptiles have been found and studied by men who have named these animals dinosaurs. Dinosaur means terrible lizard, for they were terrible in appearance and their bones resemble those of the lizard we know today. Let us now go to Utah with an expedition from the Carnegie Museum to hunt the petrified remains of these monsters. Camera footage now shows two men on horses riding through a rocky landscape dotted with shrubs. Both are dressed in work clothes, with boots and wide-brimmed hats. The riders stop. The first one uses a pickaxe to point at a location in the distance. Both climb off their horses, grabbing towels from the saddlebags, and head up the hill on foot. Wearing sturdy boots, one of the men picks up rocks and examines them as he wanders through the rough landscape. The hill he's on is sloping upwards at a steep angle. He drops a bag and examines a heavy rock, showing it to his colleague before they set it down and continue up the hill. Careful to watch their footing, they climb up the rocky face with their pickaxes. The man on the right points out a location even farther up the hill for the man on the left. They continue to climb. They arrive at a section of the rocky face where several dinosaur vertebrae, or spine bones, are still partially embedded in the rock. Both men use their pickaxes to lightly tap at the rock surrounding the bones. In another location, the men use pickaxes and shovels to dig away at the dirt and plants sticking out from the rocks. The man in the foreground grabs a bag off of one of the rocks and offers it to his partner. He waves it away. The man holding the bag lifts it to his mouth and takes a drink from it. Two other men in overalls are balanced on the steep hillside. They're using hammers to drive metal spikes deep into the rock face. Now that the holes are drilled, the men are standing beside a large can that says powder. The man on the left feeds a long rope into one of the drill holes with a pole. The other man watches with his hands in his pockets. The camera now shows the hillside from a distance. The top explodes in a shower of debris. Back at the location with the bones embedded in the rock face, a man climbs up and kneels beside them. He sets down some tools, dusts the bones with a brush, then taps at the rock with a hammer and chisel. Now a man is painting large squares onto the rock face, forming a grid. Each square is about five feet long by five feet tall. The dinosaur vertebrae are visible inside one of the squares. A drawing of the grid appears on screen with the bones outlined to show their position. In another location, two men are heaving rocks and dirt onto a large cart. Together, they heave a heavy, pale rock onto it. Beneath the cart are metal wheels sitting in metal tracks like a mine car. The cart has been pushed to the edge of a hill. 
The men lift up the cart's back end like a wheelbarrow, dumping out the rocks and dirt before wheeling it back. The camera now pans across the fossil quarry, which is full of partially excavated dinosaur bones. All along the wall, people are using tools to dig the fossils out. A man in dirty overalls kneels at the top of a wooden ladder as he excavates some ribs with a hammer and chisel. The ladder is set just above an enormous leg bone. A string of tail bones are embedded in the rock to his left. The dark colored bones are easy to see in the pale rock face. A sack is balanced on top of the ladder to cushion the man's knees. Kneeling into the sack on the ladder propped against the wall, the man repeatedly swings the hammer onto the top of the chisel with great force. As he does, large chunks of rock fall from around the bones. Thin white lines are visible in the rocks closest to the fossils. These are scars left behind by the chisel's blade. The video clip changes. The man on the ladder has adjusted his position, but is still working to excavate the same rib bones as before. In another scene, a man pulls a tool out of a makeshift forge. He places it onto an anvil and beats the metal with a small hammer. A fire blazes in a metal tent behind him. He turns and places the tool back into the flames. Back on the rock wall, two men stand at either end of a large bone excavating with chisels. This bone is from a large, long-necked plant-eating dinosaur called a sauropod. The huge bone is nearly as long as the man on the right is tall. In a different area, shaded by a canvas sheet, three men sit on the rocks, swinging their hammers rhythmically. A title card appears. Brontosaurus, Thunder Lizard. Length 80 feet, weight 40 tons. Largest land animal that ever lived. His food was soft vegetable matter. A claymation Brontosaurus appears on screen. The animal walks on four legs, has a very long neck, and a long tail about the same length as its neck, dragging along the ground behind it. The dinosaur seems to be in a lush habitat full of plants. There are very, very tall, spindly trees visible in the background behind it. These make the dinosaur seem a bit smaller than it likely would have appeared in life. The claymation dinosaur is able to keep its body stationary, using its long neck bending around back and forth to look for food as it chews. The dinosaur grazes along the ground before wandering down the hill. It moves very slowly. Another title card reads, Stegosaurus, Cover Lizard, another of the vegetable feeders, one of the most bizarre looking animals of all time, length 20 feet. In a different tiny set, lined with plants and trees of various heights, a claymation stegosaurus steps into the frame. Its legs are short enough so that its belly and tail both drag along the ground. A close-up reveals the texture of its body to be rough, like crocodile skin. The signature feature of stegosaurus, a series of large round plates, run the length of the animal's spine. The camera has cut to the inside of a cave, where two well-groomed live-action humans watch the animal nervously. Back outside, the stegosaur flicks its tongue like a snake. Its movements are reminiscent of large modern-day lizards, like a Gila monster or a Komodo dragon. Flicking its tongue, it sniffs in the direction of the cave before shuffling away. The camera cuts again to reveal another forest scene. There's a close-up of a live snake beside a log on the ground. A new angle reveals a claymation rendition of a large flightless bird. The bird resembles an emu, except for its large head and even larger beak. This is meant to be a prehistoric species from the Cenozoic period, called a terror bird. Walking like a chicken, it takes three large steps forward, then stops for a moment to preen its feathers. Now it lifts one huge foot to scratch its face. Turning its head to the left, it rips off a tree branch to eat. Suddenly, it appears to notice something on the ground. With its head bent close to the ground, it sidesteps over, then dips its head into the bushes and pulls out a wriggling snake. The terror bird begins to eat the snake just like a modern bird. A new title card says Triceratops, three horn face, a vegetable feeder about 25 feet long. His enormous horns and neck frill protected him in battle against all but the tyrant lizard. The camera reveals a claymation triceratops, eating grass from the ground like a cow. A large horn sits atop its nose, similar to a rhino. 
Two even larger horns are situated above its eyes. Behind them, a fan-shaped neck frill sweeps out over its neck, stopping before the shoulders. It takes short steps forward, dragging its tail along behind it and shaking its head as it eats. The camera pans over to reveal another triceratops pushing a rock with its face. The two triceratops now have their heads bowed forward, horns locked in battle like a pair of elk. They turn slowly, testing each other's strength, before one of them gives up and leaves the scene. A title card says, Tyrannosaurus, Tyrant Lizard, 35 feet long, the largest flesh eater on record, very fond of triceratops. A claymation T-Rex steps into the frame. The triceratops looks up, mouth open, and steps backward. The T-Rex gnashes its teeth, rushing forward. It circles the triceratops. The triceratops adjusts its position so that its horns face the predator. The T-Rex lunges. It bites one of the horns, then bites the triceratops' back. They pause for a moment in a stalemate, the T-Rex gnashing its teeth. Each time it lunges, the Triceratops thrusts its horns. Finally, the T-Rex overtakes the Triceratops, knocking it over. The Triceratops struggles, pinned under the Tyrannosaur's feet. The T-Rex takes a bite, then licks its lips. We now return to the dinosaur quarry, where two men are standing next to some bones in the wall. They take turns dipping strips of burlap into a bucket full of wet plaster. They are covering a leg bone with the strips, smoothing the plaster down with their hands. A man appears on screen, smiling at the camera as he shakes off the plaster. Now that the plaster is dry, another man uses a small brush to paint something onto the plaster-covered leg bone. It says femur in parentheses, along with some other assorted letters and numbers. Taking a sledgehammer, he hammers down some metal rods that have been inserted at intervals into the rock just below the bone. Ropes are looped around each end of the femur, which in turn are attached to a metal pulley suspended above it. There is now a large crack running along the rock below the bone. Two men are yanking on pulley ropes, lifting the bone, while a man on the right uses a crowbar to try and pry it out of the rock. Once the bone is lifted up a few inches, the men slide two long wooden boards, each about a foot wide, underneath the bone to form a ramp. They carefully loosen the pulley and slide the plaster-wrapped femur onto the boards. In another scene, multiple men attempt to move an enormous plaster-wrapped fossil about the size of a horse. The whole thing resembles a large rock in appearance. Using a lever made from thick wooden poles, it takes four men working diligently to even slightly adjust it. In the foreground, two men have a lodge pole wedged underneath the fossil. They push down on it repeatedly, attempting to lift it up, while a man in the background attempts to turn it with a smaller pole. Once in place, the men roll a large wooden platform shaped like a table over to the fossil. It's secured to the table's underside with ropes. On the right side of the screen, Two men are using enormous wooden poles to push at the rock, while three men opposite them are pulling thick pulley ropes in an attempt to wrench the table onto a lodgepole ramp. In the background, mules can be seen flicking their long ears. The fossil is so heavy that even through coordinated efforts, they are still straining to get it onto the ramp. Finally, they succeed in moving the huge fossil onto the ramp. The Carnegie Museum appears on screen. Inside, two men use saws to cut open a huge wooden crate. Straw falls to the floor when they lift the top off. Inside, what appears to be a large rock is actually a huge fossil covered in dried plaster. Using a hammer, chisel, and crowbar, a scientist removes the plaster jacket. Clouds of dust puff up into the air wherever he strikes the plaster. At last, using the crowbar, he manages to peel off the plaster shell. After removing the plaster jacket, this worker, called a preparator, uses fine tools to carefully excavate the rock closest to the bones. Some of the tools he is using are a small hammer and chisel, a turkey baster to blow away dust, and a bowl full of water with a sponge for wetting the fossils. This seems to make the fossils darker so that they're easier to see. He also uses a paintbrush to swipe away dust produced by the excavation process. 
The camera has zoomed in so that we can see him using super fine chisels. As he excavates, we see dinosaur vertebrae begin to emerge. He brushes some liquid over the areas he has just excavated. As the rock falls away from the surface of the bone, he blows away the dust. Five whole vertebrae are visible now, and he brushes a dark liquid onto each one. The preparator holds a small chunk of fossil in his hand. He examines where to place it before mixing up some glue in a bowl. Using a painter's spatula, he wipes it onto the fossil, then carefully attaches it to one of the vertebrae. Again, using the spatula, he smooths over the glue where the two pieces are connected. The preparator has moved on to excavate the skull of a long-necked dinosaur called a Diplodocus. Using what appears to be a pencil, he traces the shape of the orbital bones, the bones surrounding the eye. Now, he gently taps at the end of a chisel to excavate the rock surrounding it. The excavated skull now sits on a rotating display. The preparator spins it, carefully brushing the crevices with a small paintbrush. There are many holes in the skull called fenestrae. He wipes the brush over each of the fenestrae and between the teeth. Now the camera shows the fossil skeleton of a juvenile Camarasaurus. This was another long-necked plant-eating dinosaur, and the fossil is still partially embedded in the rock. The skeleton is nearly complete, showing the ribs, hips, legs, and tail still articulated or connected in a lifelike pose. From above, we can see the preparator excavating the tail bones. Now the preparator is working on a different fossil. This one sits on a table and appears nearly as large as he is. Some of the pieces have broken off, and he is reattaching them with glue or putty. Now the camera pans across a long line of connected vertebrae. The bones have wooden sticks propped against them, presumably to hold them in place. One man holds a bucket and pours a white substance into a funnel that another man is holding over the fossils. In another scene, three men, wearing aprons and bow ties, are shaving away the surface of a long piece of plaster while another man looks on. The workers are now holding what appears to be a long, wiggly-shaped piece of metal. It looks almost like a shiny, oversized hiking stick with lots of bumps and a big knot in the center. There's a brief photograph of a man welding the wiggly chunk of metal near a skeleton. With the skeletons now fully excavated, put together, and mounted in lifelike poses with metal beams, visitors of all ages mill about beneath the dinosaurs. Even the tallest people in the scene are still shorter than the upper leg bones of the massive sauropods. A pair of mustachioed museum goers in suits are touching the back legs, gesturing with their hands as they speak to one another. There's a cluster of smiling museum goers listening to the men from the other side of the dinosaur. A close up of the sauropod's foot reveals that it has five digits, but only three claws. The screen is now black, and the film is over.